like that, but a little bit different. We also have an app, and the reason for that is because we encourage civic engagement through petitions. So the petition's just like the door opening into your civic engagement. The things that you might do next is get involved with other people like you who care about the same issues as you and form a group with them, connect with people from across the country who also sign the same petition as you, and your signature on Brigade is different than your signature on another petition site because we can verify whether or not you're registered to vote. And that is something that petition targets, meaning your elected officials, care about a lot. I'm a digital organizer here and I've worked for other petition platforms and I can say firsthand that elected officials care a lot about whether or not you're registered to vote in their district and if they're looking at your signature on a petition, they're only going to take it seriously if you can vote them in or out of office. Um, so please sign a petition on Brigade. <laughs> Tell your elected officials what you care about. November is coming up really, really shortly. Uh, and yeah, tell your friends to do the same. Form a brigade together. Take action. Talk to me or Marlene or someone else who works at Brigade afterwards and we'll tell you a bit more about it. I'll hand it over to Erin now. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you Alright, well thank you again for coming to Banks. Climate action friend or foe. <laughs> So we're going to do some real talk tonight. You may have heard some um, or be hearing of some commitments from big banks over the next few weeks, and that's great. We definitely want that to happen. But we also need to talk about what's happening behind the scenes, what's happening on the flip side. So tonight is all about real talk. We've got some real talkers here to help us through that process. Um, first, I just wanted to let you know a little bit about your hosts. So we, Beneficial State Foundation and Bank, are one of your hosts. And um, the Beneficial State Foundation, where I work, is actually the sole economic shareholder of Beneficial State Bank. So we're a nonprofit organization that owns the bank. And our mission is to both support the social and environmental mission of the bank, as well as change the banking system for good through advocacy, through standard setting, through field building. Now the bank itself is a triple bottom line bank based in Oakland. It's a certified CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, and it's the third highest ranking B Corp in the world. We, um, I'm trying to remember exactly how many employees we have these days. We have 235, I think, employees. We're in California, Oregon, and Washington. We have just over a billion dollars in assets with which to those of you who aren't in banking probably seems like a big number, but if you think of the, the banks that are too big to fail, they're about 2,500 times bigger. <laughs> so our mission together at the Banking Foundation is to build prosperity in our communities equitably, to restore the environmental commons, and to change the banking system for good. We are a member of our other host organization, which is the Global Alliance for Banking on Values. It's a member-based organization, global, as, as you can tell by the name, uh, founded in 2009 with a similar mission to change the banking system across the world. It, it, we have members in pretty much every continent, so Asia, Africa, Australia, Latin America, North America, and Europe. We serve collectively over 50 million customers, and we hold up to about 163 in assets. And we support about 60,000 workers. So that's a pretty significant network of banks that actually want to change the world and change banking. So at this point, I want to just give you the round um, of what's going to happen for the evening, and then I'll pass it over to Kat. So first, Kat's going to lay some uh, context for the conversation, that's Kat Taylor. She's the co-founder of Beneficial State Bank and Foundation. Then she's going to um, host the conversation with our esteemed colleagues, Reverend Yearwood from Hip Hop Caucus and Ken Leroux from First Green Bank. And then we'll have lots of time for Q&A. And so keep your questions in mind. We definitely want to have a lot of participation. We'll have a lot of time for that. And uh, finally, I just want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank Brigade, again, for hosting us. I want to thank all the staff running around doing all the good work to make this uh, work out tonight. And I believe that is it. I'm going to turn it over to you, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Picture. Am I on? 
Can you hear me? Yeah, there we go. Sorry. Hi. How is everyone? Okay. By the end of tonight's conversation, I hope you will have a clearer view in your mind, uh, those of you at the Global Climate Action Summit, of what you love that's gone on so far, what you wish would go on, and what you think isn't being discussed. We want to get really far inside of banking, inside of justice, equity, and resistance movements, and the intersection of the two. So I'm going to lay a little bit of context that's um, hopefully overlapping for both. Um, uh, starting with the fact that capital has been beating up on labor for at least 350 years of this country's history. And labor, after all, is just people. So we, of course, recall that this country was founded in slavery, a native genocide, less than personhood for half the people, immigrant and refugee persecution. We have to wonder why we're still suffering those legacies. And I would argue that we need to follow the money to figure out why. So that's why we started a bank, because we had a hunch, like the rest of uh, the people in America and beyond, that something was terribly wrong in banking. To us, banking is the original and most powerful form of crowdfunding. It should be a really beneficial actor in society. It's all of us pooling our idle cash, which we call deposits, into a banking system, giving it special privileges, like the, the ability to self-insure through the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, meaning that all of us can put money in a bank and not lose it up to $250,000 because the American government, which really means us, the American taxpayer, stands behind that. And we saw that happen in the Great Recession where banks were failing, but people didn't lose their money. That means that the money coming into that system is the cheapest money around, pretty much. Even cheaper, really, on average than securitization. And what did we put our money together to do? Well, we wanted to finance a world in the future, now, that we all that was the best place to live and work for all. But that's not happening either. And we see that, I'm not going to dwell on the negative, but we see that in the train of misery that the banks are dragging behind them. So notwithstanding the beautiful proclamations that we may even hear this week, uh, in the last five years alone, we've seen five million homes lost in foreclosure, uh, uh, disproportionately affecting communities of color, $360 billion of fines for consumer abuse without any change in practice, one third of tellers are on some form of public assistance, even though they work for the most profitable corporations in the world. And we're still pouring money into coal. And coal is a bankrupt industry that's transferred its right. pension liabilities onto the public. So something is terribly wrong in banking. And I think we need to get inside that. And uh, Ken and I are here to represent sort of the counterfactual, those banks that are motivated by morality. Global Alliance for Banking on Values are banks that are driven by values, not by profit maximization. Now we also have the most uh, encouraging, rousing rise of people-powered movements than we've seen in a while justified by the injustices around us, but gaining power every moment. There were protests today. Uh, when I was walking to the summit, I was very torn between joining the protesters and walking inside. Because they're saying it's not enough. It's not enough, it's not soon enough, it's not getting to the core of the justice at the root of climate. So, uh, the Reverend Yearwood is going to give us a really great insight from DAPL to the people powered movements uh, to what we should be demanding of the institutions in our society, beginning with business. So that's what I started with capital and labor. We really have to get the fundamental institutions of society right or no amount of philanthropic or governmental resources are going to clean up after that. That tail just doesn't wag that dog. So I hope I can uh, prevail with the Reverend Yearwood to start by just talking about his journey in establishing the Hip Hop Caucus, what it represents, uh, the, what activities it's engaged in, where it's going, uh, what he sees the promise of people power movements, and then I'm going to turn to Ken. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ken. It's, it's an honor to be here. I'm actually so happy to be here um, for so many different reasons. One, 
Um, I've actually already achieved my goals. I've met some of my dear friends who are here, um, already hung out, able to meet uh, my brother, uh, Bill McKibben, came by yesterday. We were doing our Think 100% uh, podcast, the coolest show on climate change. Um, and then my other brother here, Tom, came in. So I'm, I'm actually complete. I actually can go. So I'm not, you know, pretty much done. But I, I, I just want to say a, a few things. If you don't know the Hip Caucus, it's an amazing organization um, that definitely works um, as far as getting young folk engaged in the political process. Um, actually, the executive director of the Hip Caucus is here. I don't know if she's in the back. Uh, Liz Hafstad, she was waving her hand. Um, there she is, everybody is Liz. She's actually one of you, she's a Californian, so you know, she's from most, I'm from, I'm from Louisiana, so the other LA. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, our, our, our chair board leader, Rosario, and I leave with that because as we're at this climate conference, there is no climate movement without women. And so that is the core of the movement, especially in the core if we're going to be successful. And there is no climate movement without indigenous people and people of color. And there is no movement, yes, you can definitely clap to that. And there is no movement if we don't center our conversation, not with frontline communities coming to the table, but knowing that frontline communities and communities of color are the table. And so the conversation should start there. So this conversation regarding bank, friend of foe, from my mindset, starts with the table coming out of vulnerable communities. Before I kind of get started, I kind of want to make sure you understand. I wear a lot of hats, literally. I wear a lot of hats um, with a lot of different things on them. Some are funny, like frack is whack. Um, uh, some, are, some are very serious. I have names of, of what people who have, who have passed away. Uh, either here in our country, from Trayvon Martin to Sandra Bland to Brenda Caceres. So I have a lot of hats. Um, this actually is my saddest hat. Um, this is the number um, that Harvard said was the amount of people who were killed in Puerto Rico. Um, and so, and then the actual number that our government says, um, which is still in between this and the number is at least um, you know, close to 3,000. I wear this hat because, um, and you should know my background, that I was an officer in the Air Force. So I literally, literally pledged to put my life on the line for this country. And did that when I had two small children. And so that's my background, that I love my country. Um, but I'm also steeped in the history of my people. Uh, my father was the dean of African American students at Howard University. But I say this with this hat because today the president put out a tweet um, that was in regards to uh, the number of people who were killed. And so that was a Democrat um, hoax. And it was, and I just thought, it just, it took, I mean, I've seen so many things that have been so outrageous, but that touched me because. As I thought about that, and me being from Louisiana, I remember and know the effects of climate change. I remember the story of Mama D, who was a beautiful grandmother with, with, with long gray dreadlocks, who went out there to tie her neighbors to the tree when they were floating down Dergeron Street in the seventh ward of New Orleans, because those were her neighbors. I remember the stories of folks from Puerto Rico who said they were elders who were literally in their living room, who were literally at their kitchen praying to God that the water would go down and literally being washed away while their children were trying to catch them by their stockings as they were drowning in their houses in Puerto Rico. And so when you understand those stories, and I know the heartbreak that the number doesn't even do justice for those who died after the storm, when they were moved and put on buses and left for dead and, and left for homeless and couldn't pay a light bill. That's the thing. So for this president to then make comment that this number ain't real, then we as the United States must make a change. <laughs> we have to believe 
And so for me, the Hip Hop Caucus is an organization which, that has gone there really across the country, so from Flint to Standing Rock. And so our entree into this process is that as we are out there in the streets, we realize that you can't only be in the streets, you have to be in the suites as well. And so we begin to think about how we could begin to look at these dirty banks who are funding particularly the, the fossil fuel infrastructure. Uh, of, of putting their money to something that was really, for many young people, their business plan was a death sentence for them. And so we began to just raise that awareness, recognizing as water protectors, fighting for uh, clean water and clean air because climate change is definitely a civil rights issue. We realized that this issue of making sure banks front and center was a resistance move. And I will get more into that, but that will be the kind of the tone of what we do at the end of our caucus. Thank you. So, reaching off that, um, I, at Beneficial State Bank, we never separate social justice from environmental well being because they're flip sides of the same coin. If you separate them, they divide and conquer each other. And if you think about it, the way we prosecute our natural resource agenda either leads to oppression and the diaspora, or it can lead to something really beautiful. I was reminded of this, I saw a play this weekend written by a Cherokee woman attorney called Manahatta. She did it in collaboration with the tribal leadership of the tribe that actually uh, occupied Manhattan Island at the time of Peter Stuyvesant. And uh, that island was robbed through the beaver trade, basically. And uh, the play juxtaposes it to the fall of Lehman Brothers and the Great Recession. Yeah. Like a whole lot of other people were robbed of things. Um, uh, and so I say that in preface to uh, asking Ken to talk about, and he's a very humble person, so we're going to get Ken to talk about uh, the wonderful work he's doing and has done at First Green Bank in Florida around environmental work and environmental justice in the banking sector, even though I imagine he's going to say that it wasn't much, it's a huge amount of work, particularly in the context of Central Florida, where there's not a lot of support. Uh, there's no real commitment without sacrifice. We're going to talk a bit in a bit about the Bank of the West uh, commitment at this climate, uh, preceding this climate summit, and they're getting pilloried for it. Uh, no real commitment without sacrifice. So I'm going to hand off to Ken now to talk about his bank for it. Oh, so it's hard to follow those two. Um, but Reverend Yearwood left me a, a launching point um, when he talked about Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin was killed 17 miles from my home. Um, and um, actually Donald Trump took the term shithole from me because Florida is the first and constant shithole. Um, and I, I've, I've entered a very profane